Welcome, my name is Kevin, and this is the Bible Artist Podcast. I believe the arts can give us fresh eyes to see the significance of the Bible and the beauty of the gospel. And I also believe the Bible can provide the arts with complex characters and stories with profound insight into the human condition. I've been a fan of Bible art for most of my life, and so over the past few years, I've been exploring popular biblical adaptations, and I've been encouraging Christian communities to discuss and engage with the arts. And today I'm here with Christopher Powers, who oversees Full of Eyes, a ministry that creates and shares exegetical artwork and animation. Uh, Christopher, could you tell us kind of what exactly exegetical artwork is and the story of how you got involved with your ministry? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Kevin, for having me on here. Um, right. So typically when we hear the term um, exegesis or exegetical, the the thought is that it's something where we're taking a text, typically a text of scripture, and unfolding its meaning through words. So you think about an exegetical commentary or um, expository or exegetical preaching. And um, exegetical art or the term visual exegesis, which is the one you'll see me uh, using on my work often, um, is the idea of doing that same process of taking a text and unfolding its meaning, um, but the the uh, the form of that unfolding, rather than being verbal or textual, is visual. So the picture itself is communicating the artist's understanding, which hopefully is is the author's understanding of the text that they are expositing. So you should be able to come to a work of visual exegesis and in looking at the visual form and the images and the symbols and the meanings, um, begin to understand uh, the, a, a reading of the text from which it is drawn, such that sitting under the visuals of that picture is akin to entering the artist's mind and understanding the text with them. And then to the extent that they've understood the text faithfully, um, you are given, you are also brought into uh, a, a reading and an understanding of that text. So that's the idea of visual exegesis or exegetical artwork. Um, and then how did I get started with this? Um, well, Full of Eyes is the, is the ministry that I have. And um, that really began, it began in its nascent form back in college, which for me would have been around 2008, 2009, um, when I was drawing pictures as a means of prayer. So um, with the things that I'm wrestling with in my soul, and like, uh, is it Psalm 62, I believe, that says, um, trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart to him. So as I'm working on pouring out my heart to the Lord, I'm finding that um, a way of expressing that is in drawing images that take the um, uh, the abstract concepts of the soul's life and mm. concretizes them in a visual form. Mm. And so I'm, I'm drawing pictures like this as a means of communicating and, and finding that this process is helping me understand, helping me mm. articulate, even if it's visually articulate, helping me articulate um, what is... At, ironically, perhaps not as easily articulated with words. Mm. Um, so I'm already doing this kind of thing. And then uh, my first job was as the video director at a church. And so 2009, 2010, I took this kind of art and set it to music and made an animation um, mm. set to Casting Crowns, Praise You in This Storm song, um, mm. which that animation is no longer available online because in my naivete, I did not get any sort of license to use that song. Um, so that's just on my personal hard drive. Anyway, so that, but that was the beginning of, um, okay, I can take art and expressive images and mingle them with um, scriptural truth or, or music or whatever else it is and create something that communicates um, hmm. to people. And hopefully uh, this has become sharper and sharper, communicates Christ, the beauty mm. of God in Christ. And so that's kind of how it began back in 2009 or 10. And then it became an official, you know, quote unquote, official ministry. It became what I'm doing mm. more or less full time beginning in 2014. Wow. 
and you're also a, a pastor, right? Yeah, as of 2017, I've um, I'm also the preaching pastor at a little church here in Ohio, which has been wonderful to tether the artistic and abstract and speculative work of Full of mm. Eyes. I mean, more speculative yep. than, than than not, and then the um, the rigorous expository, mm. soul forming work of pastoring. Mm. Um, so the the pastoring and the, the the need to stand before real people and give them Christ every weekend mm. anchors me to um, the clear and the specific, um, even as the you know the exploration of of more perhaps the aesthetic and symbolic aspects of Christ mm. um, helps me then bring some of that into the preaching. So I think these mm. two balance each other well and support mm. each other well and i i would i would be impoverished if either one of them were uh were taken away so mm. i'm grateful that the lord has given both for this season mm. that's awesome thanks christopher um so the actual title of your ministry full of eyes is if i understand right a reference to the book of revelation in chapter four yes. where john he sees these spiritual beings, the four living creatures, and he says that they're full of eyes. So I'm curious yeah. kind of your understanding of that text and why it's the, the name of your ministry. Yeah, so it's in Revelation chapter four, um, verses six through eight, um, where John is having this vision of the uh, heavenly throne room, which is really the heavenly holy of holies, um, which I'm arguing, um, in my post-grad work right now, that it's also really the vision of the cross, um, wow. that he he says this, um, and I there were four living creatures, each of them with six wings. They are full of eyes all around and within, and they're surrounding the throne. Um, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So these eyes, you know, there's questions about what are these creatures meaning? It's, you know, how, what's Paul, or what's John saying with the symbolism here? At the very least, the eyes are the organ of perception. It's a mm -hmm. seeing, it's a, it's a perceiving. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're filled with eyes all around and within indicates these beings um, exist solely for the sake of perceiving. Every facet of their being is unto the end of perceiving. And they are ordered around the throne of God. So their, their whole being exists to perceive and the, the entirety of that being is aimed at the throne of God. And they're continually seeing, continually seeing. And it says they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Which in, and, and so I would say, it's not as if God said to them, keep saying this and just don't stop. And so, okay, I just rather as their entire angelic soul is turned to perceive God, they are consistently perceiving greater depths, greater heights, further breadths of his beauty. And that's consistently overwhelming them. And therefore that's consistently erupting in ever fresh praise, ever fresh amazement. So it's a seeing a savoring and a singing that's mm. continually deepening and continually expressing itself. And what are they seeing, savoring and singing? Well, the the glory of God on the throne. But what is that? John explains in a few verses, it's the slaughtered and living lamb. It's, mm. it's Jesus Christ. The radiance of the glory of God, the radiance of the beauty of God is the, the crucified and risen flesh of Jesus Christ. So to have the beauty of God strike our perceiving eye is to see Christ slain and risen, is to see the lamb slaughtered and standing. And so these beings are perceiving the beauty of God in the crucified and risen Jesus, constantly seeing more, all their being bent to understand him and constantly seeing more, constantly being overwhelmed by the excellence and therefore constantly erupting in praise. And um, I named the ministry Full of Eyes 
because I think that that is what the human being exists to do. Some interpreters would take these four creatures as symbolic representations of the created world, um, in which case the human being is the uh, crown of that creation. We're the ones leading the worship leaders of, of creation. Um, so human beings exist to do this, to perceive, to savor, treasure, and to proclaim or sing the excellence of who God is in the slain and risen Jesus Christ. That's, that's, we are, that's what we are. We mm. are unto that. And so my hope is that the ministry of Full of Eyes would, first of all, be an expression of my singing, mm. what I have been given the grace to see and savor, so that the singing that I'm doing is not verbal but visual. And I hope that the things I create would be a means of others being able mm. to see, savor, and sing the dim reflection of what these creatures are seeing, which is the excellence of God radiating in the person of the slain and risen Christ. So that's where the, the name comes from. It's, a, um, it's, it's, it's both a statement of what I hope I'm doing, a statement of what I'm aspiring to do, and a statement of what I'm inviting others into. Um, so there's this idea of, of being full of eyes. Mm. Oh, that's really rich. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm, I'm already like just through our conversation, like having kind of my affections, uh, turned, uh, turned to Christ. So, well, and, and I, that's a wonderful, I, I, I pray that that's more the case for us both. And the thing is the human being is full of eyes as well. Um, because we, if we exist from, through, and for Christ, as Colossians 1, 15, 16 would, would tell us, um, all things are through him and for him, then everything in us exists to know and treasure him. So everything in us is a form of I. Um, mm. My weakness is an I to see mm. him in my dependence. My strengths are an I to see him as he's working through them. My desires are eyes with which to see him because they're meant to be turned toward him. My fears are eyes with which to see him because they're meant to find their stability and their comfort in him. Um, uh, my, my needs are eyes with which to see him because he's the one who fills those. So the human being is also one of these creatures that is filled with eyes within and without. Um, and, and the task of the minister and also I would believe of the artist is to turn those eyes where they're meant to look, which is to the throne of God, which is also the resurrection illumined cross where we see the beauty of God in Christ. Mm. Oh yeah. That's so really rich. Um, I, as I'm sure people can already tell, like, you know, there's a lot of theology that's grounding your ministry. Um, and on your side, I, I noticed that you had kind of four key emphases and I think some of them have already come out a little bit, but could you, highlight those and just briefly explain uh, what those are. Yeah. So you get it right there in the concept of visual exegesis mm. that the work I'm doing um, is, is to be rooted in scripture. So, you know, there's a place for art. That's just like, this is what I felt like. I mean, the way this started was me saying, here's how I'm feeling, you know, mm. expressing art. So there, that's, I'm not saying that's not legitimate, but what I want to do is specifically anchor my work in scripture. So the first of kind of the four pillars is, is scripture. Um, I, it ought to be that any aspect of my art can be pointed to and someone say, why this? Why did you do this? And, and I can give not just a, a proof text ripped out of context, but a, a biblically rooted rationale for why something is that way and where it's drawing, why it's, why it is like that. So that's the scriptural um, anchoredness is the first pillar. But then growing out of that is uh, Christocentricity, uh, a, a centering on the slain and risen Jesus, which is really just to say scriptural, because mm -hmm. scripture is only a speaking of God in Christ in myriad ways. But to be faithfully scriptural necessarily is to be Christocentric. Mm. Um, so, but the second part of that is then everything I do, I want to be an unfolding 
of who God has declared himself to be in Jesus Christ from the cross. Um, all I want to do by grace, may it be so, is to say Jesus Christ crucified and risen. That's it. That's all I want to say in my art. That's all I want to say in my preaching. That's all I want to say in my academic pursuits, in my parenting, in my life. Um, that's If I get to the end and it's like all he ever said was Jesus Christ crucified and risen, that's fine. Uh, why say anything else? So, um, so that's all I'm doing in this, in this work because, because Jesus Christ crucified and risen is the revelation of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the father, John 14, um, six, um, 14, nine. So that is, um, that's what I want to do. So scriptural Christocentric and then evangelistic, which again is just to say all these are just saying the same thing. If yeah. if you find the the right thing to say, that's the only thing you can say because everything's about it. So anyway, everything I'm about to say is just another way of saying the same thing. Um, evangelistic, which is to say, I want my work to um, draw people and and awaken people to the all satisfying excellence of God as He is revealed in Jesus Christ, who dies under our sin and damnation and rises as our life. Um, this, this death and resurrection of Christ, um, this atoning work of Christ, um, this redeeming work of Christ is beautiful. And yet it is, it is meant to be a revelation. Like if we don't get to the point of realizing his death and resurrection redeems, but I am redeemed unto someone. And the person that I'm redeemed unto is the ones definitively declared in the work that redeems me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so what I want to do is lift up God in Christ and call people to him. Um, so it's evangelistic. I want people drawn. I want affections drawn more deeply um, toward God in Christ, which is just to say I want to be Christocentric, which is just to say I want to be scriptural. And then fourthly, fourthly, um, I've already touched on it. I want to be affectional. I want to stir the affections. Um, I don't want to just give people the strong, good um, wood of mm. theological truth. I want to give them that wood and see it ignited with the fires mm. of affectional apprehension, um, which is the work of the Spirit. Um, so I, I want the wood of the truth of Christ mm. to be kindled with the fire of the Spirit and that with, with, you know, the fire of our affectional apprehension of it so that it gives light on all things and mm -hmm. heat that comforts and strengthens and, and, and gives stability. Um, so Jonathan Edwards said something along the lines of, I consider it my duty to raise the affections of my people as high as they possibly can be raised, mm -hmm. provided that they're raised with nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is what I want to do. I don't want to stir affection for affection's sake, mm. but if I have said, if, if, if I am showing something true and good and beautiful, um, I want to try to stimulate the affections to in some way rise to the reality mm. of that, um, of what's being presented. So mm. scriptural, Christocentric, evangelistic, and affectional are kind of the four um, pillars, which are in fact just one um, which is Christ crucified and risen. Awesome. Yeah. I can definitely tell like some, you know, Piper influence. And did you go to, uh, Bethlehem, uh, for, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And in fact, um, full of eyes was created, came out of my time at, um, at the seminary there at Bethlehem. And, um, and so the affectional and the, uh, the, the Edwardsian, mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting the way those things, Though I don't think of those things as explicitly anymore, but they have worked their way down into the groundwater of my thinking. And so they're informing everything. But it's neat the way the Lord brings us along paths where, you know, at first, th like you think about a rain in the springtime, at first the water's just sitting on the surface. You can't walk anywhere without soaking in it. But then it soaks down into the soil where it is actually doing work to give growth. And so I think for, for me, um, I was so deeply steeped, as I think many people of my generation, mm -hmm. um, in um, Piper 
and his way of thinking in, in Christian hedonism, mm -hmm. um, in that whole world that's kind of an expression of the young, restless reform type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it rained down on my soul. And for a while, it was just a standing pool, mm -hmm. which was good, but it has soaked down. And so it's still down there underneath. Um, but it's not a it's not a pool on the surface anymore. All that to say, it's neat that you notice uh, that 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 effect still there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can relate to that. I kind of grew up in a similar moment and, and took a lot of the similar things. And and what you just said. Yeah, I can relate to that as far as my experience, too. So, yeah, um, uh, one of the kind of unique things about your work uh, that I've really enjoyed and loved uh, is that it's it's really filled with just so much symbolism and so a lot of rich metaphors. Uh, so I'm curious um, your thoughts on like how Christians can benefit from becoming kind of more attuned to some of these uh, biblical symbols and some of the other artistic dimensions of scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a big question with a lot of pieces to it. Um, I think that, Perhaps one thing is that um, we are moved by what we perceive as beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, whether we would put that term, that, that, that terminology to it or not, mm -hmm. um, something that shows itself to us as um, uh, uh, harmonious, as uh, excellent as uh, worthy of praise and praise, not just being, I acknowledge this is big, but mm -hmm. a, um, a drawing up of the affections, like what mm -hmm. we just said, a recognition of the, of the, the, the beauty, the harmonious, this fits with this, this fits mm -hmm. with this. And these all come together to fit here. Um, that's deeply compelling to the human soul. Um, especially in a world um, that is rebelling against that. So in, um, I mean, you could push it all the way back to the uh, Renaissance and to the, uh, you know, the enlightenment. I mean, the enlightenment is just, just such a problematic thing, um, but the destruction, the, and, and I don't know if you know of Malcolm Geit, but he talks about this quite a bit too. Um, this division of the, of the beautiful and the imaginative and the uh, affectionately aesthetically charged from the rational and the logical mm -hmm. and the, the um, uh, Epicurean understanding of things. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a false dichotomy to divide those. They ought not be divided, but that happened. And so much of our world is here now, um, essentially a materialistic understanding that you have such a desperate yearning for spiritualism of some kind, like l help me feel and tell me it's right to feel. Tell me there's a reason to feel something is, is what a lot of people are straining for. Mm -hmm. And um, scripture and Christ is holding these together, not just saying, Oh, here's something to feel uh, until your atoms dissolve or, you know, here's something to feel that's just completely amorphous, you know, a spiritualism, but it's a, a, a infinitely strict union of the supremely beautiful and the supremely rational, the supremely affectionately stirring and the supremely logically satisfying are fused together in the person of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways scripture shows us that is through its symbolic palette. Um, it's, it's palette of imagery. Um, so I'm doing my, um, my dissertation on John's verbal iconography of the crucifixion and how he presents Jesus Christ, the pierced one mm -hmm. as the visualized consummation of all of revelation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so many streams of imagery, the, literally like river flowing from the temple, mm -hmm. rivers flowing from the mountain, um, uh, uh, the lamb who's slain, the blood that is wine, that is also the blood of judgment, um, that is also the blood of sacrifice, that is also the life of the sacrificed being, the thorns as curse, 
uh, nakedness as curse and nakedness as intimacy and so many things that are that are imagery, their mm-hmm. symbolism, their their things that you intuit. John is gathering these up and presenting them to Christ and charging the vision of Christ with this with this full um, kind of symbolic depth. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not something that can be put into a doctrinal statement, as valuable as that is. Mm. It's not something that can be put into a creedal form, as valuable as that is. Mm. It's something that is to be sat under and felt. Mm. It's like a waterfall. You can take water and break it out and look at the pieces of it and and look at the the chemical molecular composition, and that's valuable and that's good. Mm. But then you can also just be baking hot on a sunny day and sit under a flow of water Mm. and just say, I'm just under this right now and it's good to be here. And I think this a recognition of the symbolic richness of scripture does that for us, helps us just sit under and and taste and feel and inhabit the beauty of who God is. Um, and that beauty uh, validating the truth and that beauty is beautiful because it is true and all these things coming together. So I think that's that would be part of what I would say. Um, the other thing, is it gives us a deeper treasuring of Christ because Mm. every theme and motif and symbol in Scripture is a pointing unto Christ. Mm. And so take any one of them and they lead you to him. And and once you've arrived at him, you find they had their source in him. Mm. He's the wellspring and the consummation of every one of Scripture's motifs and themes and symbols and and uh, types. And so to be alive to them and trace them with the, with the feeling touch of our imagination, even if we can't quite see them with the logical eye yet, to trace them, it will bring us to him. And once we've come to him, it will show us it has always been coming from him. So um, I'd say, you know, a stirring of the affectional life as it's unified, you know, this satisfying, having a, having a life that is satisfying where both the logical and the affectional are united. Mm. And then secondly, um, allowing us a greater and fuller and deeper and wider appreciation of the cosmic richness of Jesus Christ as he's unfolded in scripture. Those would be two, Mm. um, off the top of my head, but there's there's... many more. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, wow. I'm going to want to like listen back through this just because I, I feel like you unloaded a lot of uh, really rich thoughts that I'm going to want to process and, and think through. So thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, like I said, before we started, I had, I, I didn't take time to write anything out. So this is all just like mm. the fire hose initial thoughts. Mm. <laughs> so it probably could be more composed, but Oh no, it, it was time. great. <laughs> no, I like, it was just like uh, some really deep stuff that I just want to, ponder and right 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 yeah. no me too me yeah. too that's what life's for yeah figuring these things out amen um so in case some of our listeners haven't actually been exposed to your actual work um in the uh the visual podcast i'll uh share a couple of images uh and if you're just listening then uh, i'll put links to those in the show notes and you can uh, go look at those uh yourself and um, I'd like to have you uh, briefly walk us through some of those symbols uh, that you included in these images and kind of how it relates to the, the biblical text. So um, you actually, uh, all of your specific pieces of art are based um, on like one primary text. I'm sure you've got kind of a, a various other texts that inform them, but uh, you mm-hmm. name them kind of after uh, one specific uh, text of scripture. So. Uh, the first one uh, that we'll look at is Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. Yeah, so this picture is um, part of a series I'm doing on Colossians 1, 15 through 20, that kind of Christ hymn that Paul uh, gives us at the beginning of Colossians. And it's, I think we're going to mention it later, but it's its part of like a, a planned board book that I'd like to put together Um so that's that's where this is coming from. Um, but yeah, so in this image, uh, you have the the picture, something that has just kind of recaptured my theological imagination over the last two years, 
has been the, just the radical centrality of union with Christ um, for everything. Um, that union with Christ is is every everything it means to be a Christian, um, to be a human being alive to God. Um, every good comes from Him. Um, so you know, justification, sanctification, um, uh, whatever else you want to, you know, fruitfulness in life, our prayers, our suffering, our living, our dying. All of this is union to Christ. Um, so in this image, I'm wanting to show um, Christ as the head of the body of his people, the body that is his people. So you've got the um, 12 uh, little figures representing individual members of the body of Christ, 12 being a number that's often associated with the people of God, um, red both because they're washed in the blood of Christ, the redeeming blood of Christ, but also because it's, it's as if they're being born um, into and from the church. And so um, the church there then representing the, or the bride, the woman, representing the whole body of the church, um, since we're not individually called the bride, it's we're the bride as members united to one another. Um, and you can see that she is in, kind of being literally pictured in Christ. And from the right hand of the wounded Christ comes her purity. Uh, her, her the 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 white robes of the saints, which are the righteous acts of the saints, it says in Revelation 19, washed in the blood of Christ. So his from her union to him, she is robed in his righteousness. Um, that's what you see going on there. And then from his left hand is coming her glory, her crown, her sanctification. Um, so that uh, her her glory before God is the glory of Christ before God. And you can see um, that ribbon coming from his left hand crowns her, but it's also crowning him. It's a single crown. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the images I'll use often is this image of the, the five gems in the throne, in the, in the crown of Christ, which represent the five traditional wounds that Christ shows to his disciples upon his resurrection, two in his hands, two in his feet, one in his side. And so the very wounds that are the, the emblems of death and damnation and sin when they're born in the flesh of the crucified Christ, as they now are born in the flesh of the risen Christ, become the emblems of glory and beauty and, and love. And so this kind of transfiguration, not of an, er an erasing of the suffering and the shame, but a transfiguring of it itself into glory is what I'm picturing. And um, just as Christ is now crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering of death, Hebrews 2, 9, so too his bride is crowned with that same glory. Um, and then you've got in the background, the halo that is um, uh, uh, you know, shining with the radiance of the glory of God in Christ is also a picture of the open tomb so that on the bottom half of that circle, you see the dark circle that's kind of rolling down. And so that's showing resurrection. Um, so Christ is illumined in this glory as the crucified ones. He's displaying his wounds. And yet that's in light of the resurrection. And he, the head is in the light of resurrection. He is raised. Our head is raised. The bride, the body is still under that stone. She's still in this mortal coil, as it were, but through her union to Christ, she is risen in him and is being raised in him and will finally be raised in him. So I could go into more on a few little things, but that's in general what we've got going on in this picture. Wow. No, you've blown me away. Oh, because I've been looking at some of your images and just uh, taking things in, but you just took it to a whole nother uh, level uh, getting to hear some of those details. So. Next one is going to be uh, John chapter 6, verse 40. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Yeah. So this actually is a, is a great one to have chosen because it goes right along with what we were saying earlier about the name of full of eyes. Hmm. So when Jesus says, this is the will of my Father, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Well, we have to ask, Who's the son we're to be looking on? And in the context of John 6, it's the son as he is crucified and raised, the one who gives his flesh and his blood to the world, um, the son of man lifted up on the cross. Um, 
and yet he is only perceived as such. He can only be known as the crucified one who is the son of man in the revelation of God in light of his resurrection. And so for John, um, rather than there being a diachronic, the shame of this crucifixion followed by the glory of the resurrection, which is true, it's kind of a Pauline way of thinking. Um, for John, there's a synchronic fusion of these two where the shame of the crucifixion is the glory, is the radiance, is the place where Christ is seen because the crucifixion and resurrection are indivisibly fused. Mm -hmm. Christ is anastasiform for Paul, or for John, anastasis being the Greek word for resurrection. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, look on the son, he's talking about the, the one who gives his flesh and blood on the cross and yet is raised up from the dead. Look on the crucified one who is risen and believe in him. Well, believe in him in what, to what extent? Believe that he is who he says he is throughout the gospel of John, which is the revelation of the father. The one whom to see is to see God. So this is the will of God. Whoever looks on the crucified one who is risen and believes that he is the revelation of the invisible God will have eternal life. What's eternal life in John? John 17, 3, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So if we break this down, Jesus is saying, Everyone who looks at the crucified and risen one and recognizes him as the revelation of God will enter into intimate and true knowledge of the invisible God, which is true life. That's what that's what I'm inviting you into. And that's what God's will is. Um, and that's God glorified, Jesus says. That's the glorification of the Father. That's the making known of who God is. And so in this picture, I'm showing Christ on the cross. Um, crucified. And yet he's crowned with, again, that crown with the five gems in it, which is my way of saying his resurrection. He, mm -hmm. he is cr on the cross. He is seen by the eyes of faith that look from the vantage point of Easter. Mm -hmm. He is recognized as the risen and reigning king who is slain and yet living, which is why what we see on the cross is the same as what we see in, in the apocalypse in Revelation. Um, so he's crowned with with glory because he's the risen one and yet we see him as the risen one in this vision of the crucifixion illumined by the resurrection and what do we see there god himself god revealed in the son by the spirit the father known in the son by the spirit so the whole trinitarian fullness is unfolded to us on the cross the flesh of the crucified cross or the crucified christ is like the stained glass window through which we and we see the whole glory of the triune God. Um, and even though he is the son, he's, he's not, it's not the father crucified, but we see the whole Trinity in that moment. Um, so that's why you've got this triangular radiant shining from the crucified and crowned one, because we're seeing the fullness of the glory of God in him. And that's radiating out over the whole earth and the four, creatures are here representing all of created existence mm. beholding you know this is like what i talked about earlier beholding with their 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 essential being which is made to perceive beholding the glory of god mm. in the crucified and risen jesus christ and so knowing god truly and so having eternal life and the beautiful thing john tells us is this is the will of the father this is what god wants to happen mm. and so to the extent that we tap into this we're tapping into the current running through all things. This is mm. God himself says, I desire to be known in the crucified son who is risen. And this knowing humanity is your life. Mm. This is what I want. And, um, and I just want to say, okay, that's what I want. I want more of that too. And I want to be um, utilized unto that end. So that's what's, mm. what's being portrayed in this picture. Amen. One last one. Um, I think this is a earlier one for you, but Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14, the earth shall be full yeah. of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. So this is an incredibly beautiful verse and you get something similar in um, Isaiah 11, nine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and before I talk about the picture, just think about what is being said. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh 
the, the, the covenant God of Israel, the one true God, as the waters cover the sea. And you think, okay, how do the waters cover the sea? Well, aren't the waters the sea? Hmm. Um, and it's like, go out in the middle of the ocean and drop down a bucket and lift it up. What is in the bucket? Is that the waters that cover the sea or is that the sea? Hmm. How do you make a distinction? Hmm. And the, the spirit is saying the earth is going to be so permeated with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh that you will not be able to, you will not say, is this a tree or is this the beauty of God? That question won't make sense because yes is the only possible answer. Is this a mountain or is this the beauty of God in Christ? Is this a feast set before me or is this the beauty of God in Christ? Yes, yes, perfect indivisible fusion, just as the waters in the sea, so too all of creation will be permeated and, and as it were, transposed into the reverberations of the name of God declared in the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Hmm. So that's what is being anticipated for us, which of course is a beauty you could spend your whole life trying to communicate. And, and, and so then this picture is an attempt to do that, but it's, it falls far short. But so what we have is Again, you've got Christ in his cruciform position because the one upon whom we are to look is the crucified one, but the crucified one as illumined by and interpreted by and understood in light of his resurrection, which is why the crucified Jesus is here um, circled by the opening tomb of the resurrection. So he, the crucifixion, is illumined by the resurrection. And it's in that perception that as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, we know the light of the knowledge of glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. So this knowledge that will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, we see in the New Testament, that's the knowledge streaming from the face of the crucified and risen Jesus. That is the knowledge of Yahweh that's going to pervade the entire cosmos. And so flowing from the wound in his side, pouring out of his heart, as it were, which is for John a picture of many things, but essentially the spirit of God mm -hmm. um, is the knowledge of God, the spirit mm -hmm. who gives the knowledge of God in Christ. John 14, 16, he will take from what is mine and make it known to you, Jesus says. So the spirit is the one who unfolds the crucified and risen Jesus as the revelation of the knowledge of God. And that spirit is pouring from Christ's opened heart mm. and flooding the cosmos so that the dark, jagged mountains of the old entropy chained creation are being um, uh, 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 overcome and replaced mm. by the green, far green country mm. of the new creation. So that's what's, that's what's happening in this picture as well. Do you see like a connection to, to Noah there, like the flood? Um, um, that's awesome. I hadn't thought of that before, but no, that's, that's a really awesome um, way to think about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, I think you can like make, that. I think you can make that connection, right? Because the water pouring from Jesus's side on the cross, which is also the water flowing from the throne, the crystal river, the river, liver, river of living water throwing flowing from the throne in Revelation 22. Um, that water has resonances with the idea of the cosmic waters or the primordial waters of creation. And yet those waters that were kind of chaotic in the beginning um, are now conquered and channeled mm. into a river that gives life. Mm. And so it's taking an image of... Um, uh, chaos and abyss and something that needs to be formed. And it's saying that very water has been formed into a course of life mm. as it passes through and out of the crucified and risen oh. Jesus. And so um, there's every reason to say the waters of the flood mm. are, are in this way for one who is in Christ. Um, we're drowned into life. Mm. Um, the world is drowned into fullness. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's a wonderful thing. I hadn't, I hadn't made that precise hmm. connection before, but that, that's an example of the symbolic richness of scripture hmm. where you're like, okay, so the water, 
the world was covered with water at one mm. point, but it was covered unto destruction. Mm. And now it's going to be covered unto life. And, and how do we, how are we supposed to work with that? What are we supposed to think about that? Um, those are just beautiful things that the Lord gives us mm. to mull over. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious kind of what goes into a work like this, like your, your process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, so it's, it's changed over the years since we had our first child two years ago. I don't have as much. I, it used to come directly out of my time of reading and journaling in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, that time has been, uh, severely <laughs> impinged upon. Um, and so it's harder to, um, to soak in those ways that I used to, though I still try to, um, but in general, what, how these are coming about is I've, I've something that I've seen in scripture or I'm working through in scripture or that is striking me seeing Christ there. And then I, for my own sake, need to say, how would I picture this? Um, because the reason I do the pictures is because that's how my mind works. I think, you know, I don't feel like I have apprehended something until I have visualized it in some way, you know, put it into a pictorial form. And so, um, that's what I do for putting these pictures together. Hmm. And then, and then the final step is just, okay, putting that down, drawing it out and then giving out to the world. So it's, I mean, it's scripture, it's prayer, it's personal engagement with the text. And then how do I communicate that? Hmm. Awesome. And I don't know if you can hear, there's a giant tractor driving by right now. Oh. Um, we are in a rural community and the church parking lot is kind of the, the turnaround pit for all the uh, tractors and heavy machinery used during planting season. Hmm. So That's anyway, okay. yeah, <laughs> I, I like what you shared though. Uh, Cause I feel like that process, you know, not everybody's going to be able to do it to the same degree of kind of artistic excellence, maybe as someone who's uh, practiced this for a while, but that basic process is something that, yeah, even uh, people who don't consider themselves artists as their vocation can still maybe incorporate as a, a spiritual practice. Absolutely, because I never thought and arguably still do not think of myself as an artist, because mm -hmm. if you go back and look at my initial work, it was nothing special. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a mean drawing was a means of communicating something. Mm. And for some reason, they, the, the drawing seemed to help people. They helped me and they seemed to help people. So I did them more and more and incrementally became, you know, more attuned to, to, to how to draw, you know, stuff like that. I'm still have a long way to go, but I would certainly say to anyone, um, it is not, like I, like I do not do full of eyes when I am thinking clearly for other people. Hmm. Ultimately, I, I'm not doing it to show them or to, um, to, 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 to display my art. You know, I'm not doing it to say, look at what I've done. Hmm. Hopefully what I'm doing is, is expressing a, a relationship with Christ, a pursuit of Christ and expressing it visually because it helps me to express it visually. And then that is serving others and showing others Christ and pointing others to him. Um, so the artistic element is really a number of notches down hmm. on why this is done and how this is done. So um, it's like you don't have to be an excellent poet to benefit from writing, writing poetry. Um, you don't have to be a great writer to benefit from writing stories for your family and for your kids. You don't have to be a great artist to benefit from putting something abstract into visual form and just saying, I enjoyed that. That was helpful. And I, I see something more clearly now for having done that. So, um, yeah, the uh, the artistic skill thing, mm. that's that's almost the last thing that mm. should be considered. <laughs> mm. Wow. Uh, well, um, earlier you mentioned your uh, Colossians 1, uh, the board book you're working on. Uh, I'm curious to just hear a little bit more about that project. Yeah. So since our first son has come along, um, I think almost every night of his life, I have um, said to him that Christ him, you know, um, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And as it goes on from there. 
And um, early on, he just sat there because he's, you know, a, an infant. But now he's all squirmy and crawling around and uh, he's two, two years and a few months old. Hmm. And the thought is just, boy, you know, if we had a book, if I had something to show him, um, that might that might help. Hmm. And just all it is is just the pictures, which admittedly will go over his head. One of those pictures we looked at was one of them for the book. Um, and then the text of the of the hymn. Um, that's all I want. And, and I'm thinking of like foil and stuff because I'd like it to be shiny and like, you know, wow, I like to look at this because, um, you know, when you're little, those pictures, they just go in really deep. Mm. Like, you know, there's there's certain golden books where when I look at them now, it's like, oh, my goodness, this is mythically significant. Mm. Um, and so I'd like to put something like that together. Um, and I've never I realize now I made a children's book a few years ago just as a paper paperback, you know, and I realize now that it's not going to fly because a kid just rips it to shreds um, now that I actually have a child. So um, so this would be a board book um, and it would probably be something I'd have to kickstart because I'd like to make it nice. Um, so that's planned. And um, I'm just working on the pictures for it now. It's a slope. You know, I have a number of ver of different full of eyes projects going on. And so this is one that's just a long-term project mm. and we'll see if it's something I do by the end of the year or early next year. Mm. Um, there's no big rush, but I would like to get it put together. Well, please let me know when, uh, if you do do a Kickstarter, cause I've got a, a young daughter and another one on the way and would love to, to be able to share that with them. Cause it, um, yeah, I agree. I think it would be just a, a very rich and kind of soul. Um, yeah. Uh, something good for their affections. So. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I will. I will let you know. Um, well, yeah. Anything else, uh, either like projects that you're also working on or, um, yeah, just in general, like where can listeners find your work? How can they support your ministry? Sure. So, um, full of eyes.com is kind of the central hub. Um, the Lord has brought, um, a brother in Christ who is just like incredibly good at, coding and websites and things to help me put the website together. Um, I'm deeply grateful for that. So the website is now able to be searched. Like you can type anything. And if it shows up in any of my work anywhere, it'll bring those pieces up. So, you know, faithfulness and you'll see everything that mentions faithful, which is awesome. So um, full of eyes.com is kind of the place to find the, the collection of my work. And then from there you can go to various social medias it seems Instagram is the one that is most active right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, Full of Eyes is support-based. So um, we're working on maybe making a way for people to purchase prints and things through the site. But for now, uh, and that may be in place by the time you're here, your, your, your audience hears this, but for really the way Full of Eyes is supported is through monthly donation mm -hmm. um, because all of my work is always free for anyone who's in ministry or doing evangelistic or discipleship or mi uh, missionary work. So I want to create a free visual exegetical library for the global church. And because of that, um, it's a support based thing. So if people are interested in that, that's on full of eyes.com as well. And then as far as projects, there's um, I'm always continuing making new verse pictures. I'm on number working on number 1041 right now. Just plan to keep doing that as long as the Lord gives me the ability. And then um, I'm working on a new animation, which is going to be about kind of existential angst and doubt and deconstruction. Um, just kind of this whole struggling with faith thing in, in this present world. Um, so that animation probably will be coming along in the next month. And, um, and then there's always various other projects, but those are kind of the immediate ones mm. at this point. And others are you know, two or more years out. So mm. I'll just, we'll just keep those quiet for now. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, I just, uh, like I said, I, I'm going to be listening back through this conversation because I feel like you uh, brought a, a lot of really rich truths and um, yeah, uh, there's a lot, even just going back and looking at some of those uh, images that we looked at, mm. uh, there's so much to, to stand under and, and to point us to Christ. So really yeah, appreciate it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope we can talk again soon.
Um, That'd be great, Kevin. I'd love to. Thanks everyone for, for listening to the Bible Artist Podcast. Uh, please subscribe for more interviews and content related to Bible art and adaptation. And you can also visit the BibleArtist.com for uh, blogs and other content like that. Thanks for listening and Godspeed. Thanks.